Dear God, we just we acknowledge you for who you are. We acknowledge you that you are God in this place and that your Holy Spirit dwells among us, Lord. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, for, for just blessing us this morning, for waking us up, for breathing air into our lungs, Lord, even though, even though that we, we have acts that are against you every day, Lord. We have a flesh that is against you every day, Lord. We just thank you for coming to us in the time of our need, Lord, and saving us from our sins. We pray that you will forgive us, and that we repent from everything that we have done this week that has been against you, Lord. We confess our sins and our hearts right now towards you, Lord. We, we examine ourselves so that we may come to you blameless right now, Lord, and that you would, that you would hear our prayers right now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for everything that we have done, Lord. We love you. Thank you. We thank you for giving us thanks, Jesus, for us, Lord. And everything that we give to you is through this name right now, Lord. We just lift up right now, we lift up uh, Robin's co worker, uh, her, her mother, Anna Rubio, needs prayer for healing. In the hospital now, severe pain, and doctors don't know what's going on. Lord, well, we just we pray right now for, for Anna Rubio and her healing, and, and, and the doctors for, for, for God to move through the doctors. Lord, well, like, like Pastor Cole said, doctors make mistakes, but God, you do not. So we just pray that you move through the doctors right now. Find the cure. Find, first of all, find what's going on with her. And you're able to move swiftly and heal it right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. We just pray that you touch her heart right now and just give her all the faith in the world to know that you are going to work this out in her healing. And just increase her faith along with her healing. We just pray that in Jesus' name, Lord, we just pray that you do that, Lord. For uh, filing Pastor Cherry, God, God's will be done. Um, uh, he is in uh, ICU in critical condition right now. Lord, so we just pray for his health. We pray that your will be done in his life, Lord. We know that he is a great man of God and that you have put him in a position to, to touch so many people, Lord. So we just pray that all those prayers are lifted up right now. You hear those prayers, Lord, and you touch his body right now. You begin to heal him at this moment right now, Lord. We believe that you will do that in the name of Jesus. Everyone in this room. Just, we, we give our prayers, we give our, our, our hearts to uh, Pastor Cherry right now. Whatever God you can do in this moment right now, we know that you can do it in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We just pray for Curtis that he finds a home and provisions, Lord. We know that you move through people. We know that you speak to people, Lord. So we just ask that you would bring divine appointments to Curtis right now, Lord, so he can find a home and provisions, Lord. Bring people in his life that have the resources that he needs, Lord. And also have the have the, uh, the resources to teach him, Lord, to go out and get it himself, Lord. Not just to give it to him, Lord, but to give him give him the, the 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 ability to go out and earn and get things for himself, Lord, so that you can keep providing for him, Lord. We know that you give the increase as long as we do the work, Lord. So increase his faith, increase his ability to go out and, and, and do things, Lord, so we can keep providing for him, Lord. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray that you for the best for this morning. We pray, pray for Bob that he continue to have recovery from his surgery, Lord. Uh, the praise report that he is in rehab now, that he is about to move around so Lord. We just we give you thanks. We give you thanks for Bob and his continued uh, healing from his surgery, Lord. Last last week we prayed that he get the healing that he needed. We get the rest, that he got the rest that he needed, Lord. And now we just pray that he continues to heal and get back to better than he was before, Lord. We know that you are going to do these things if his faith is there, so I pray that for his faith and all the people around him to be building him up in you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, I pray for my cousin Rodney, who is recovering from a stroke. He's been in the hospital for a little bit over a week. He had a stroke. He's a young guy. He's in his early 40s, Lord, so I just pray that you will continue to move through him. I've seen my family come close together through this, Lord, so I just, I just pray that you know you know what you want to do through his, through his struggles, Lord. You know that you want to bring our family closer together. You know you want to bring us closer to you, God. So I just pray that it continues to strengthen our bond with each other and strengthen our bond with you, Lord. And that, that may bring him here, Lord, but that's ultimately what he wants. He wants to be closer to his family, and he wants to be closer to you, Lord. So I just pray that, that this stroke just brings about that healing in his life and in our family. I just, I just pray for my wife, who's been struggling, my wife Leslie, who's been struggling with blood pressure issues, Lord. I just pray that you would just continue, continue to move in her body, Lord, and heal 
her vitals, that she would not need any medication, Lord, that, that her, her blood pressure would not go up and down, Lord, that she doesn't have to worry about these things. She can go to work, she can come home, she can go work out, she can do everything that she needs to do in her life, Lord, without having to worry about something extra that she needs to do to take care of her body, Lord. I just pray that you will move her right now, Lord, and she do it by her faith, Lord. She is strengthening her faith every day. She is chasing after you. She is she is pursuing you, God, and I just pray that as she pursues you, Lord, you continue to heal her body, Lord, and just take away everything that she does not need, Lord, and just heal her right now. I pray for uh, one, of, one of my students at school who has some foot issues, Lord, said the doctor did not know what the spots were on her foot, did not, did not explain it, and she could barely walk around last week, Lord, so I just pray that you move in that situation, Lord, that you just give the doctor a clear explanation of what's going on with her feet, Lord, and you just move, and you just, just heal her body, Lord, she's an athlete, she loves to move, she loves to get up, she loves to get out and play, and that's how she, that's how she gives the glory to you. So I just pray that you just give her, give her the ability to keep giving you glory through her athletics and whatever she needs to do. Just feel her faith wherever she is right now. Touch her right now through the doctors, through her family's faith, and through her faith. Lord. Bring her closer to you as you feel her faith. In Jesus' name, we know this now. Lord, we keep praying for Madison and her brain tumor, Lord. We know that she wants to do great and mighty things through her, through this thing that is going on through her in her life, Lord. So we just pray for her family to keep building her up, Lord. We pray, we pray for the doctors. We just, we just pray, Lord, that if it's in your will, Lord, that you just remove, that you just touch her right now and heal her, Lord. So that her testimony will be that much greater, Lord, and she will draw more people to you through that testimony, Lord. It's through your power. Nothing's too great or too small for you, Lord. So we know that you can do it. There's no reason that we can't believe that you can't dry up cancer. There's no reason that we can't die to lose it. So we just believe you to do it. We believe you to do it once and for all. And not for her glory, but for yours. For her to testify to somebody else that God did it for me and he can do it for me. Yes. We pray that you move right now. Right now in Madison life, Lord. We pray for the church uh, of South Lake and then Pastor Hammond, Lord, and the work that they're doing over there at that at that ministry, Lord, we just pray that you continue to build them up in your spirit. Continue to work, to move in their members, Lord. Create some fire in their in their members, Lord, so that they can that they can help Pastor Heaven and get his vision out to the community, Lord, and just keep doing everything for your kingdom. For your kingdom. For your kingdom, Lord. And Lord, we also pray for the, uh, the ministry here, one by the outreach. We pray for Grace Restoration Church. All the ministry that has happened here, the vision, Lord, we continue to pray for the vision that was set forth years ago with Pastor Cole and First Lady Cole, Lord, and that that vision continues to move every day and gets closer to fruition, Lord. Keep, keep giving the resources, keep bringing the people. We know we have more people to bring into the fold, to take over areas, Lord, that they need help in, the Lord. There are only two people, Lord, so I, I just pray that you continue to send people, continue to send people with the same vision, the same on the same accord, Lord, just moving in one spirit to see that this, this ministry moves forward, Lord. And I just pray that you continue to, continue to uh, keep their hearts humble, keep them obedient to what you are telling them to do, Lord. Fill them every day for what they give out to this ministry, Lord. I pray for the word that's going to go forth, Lord, for Pastor Cole today, Lord. I pray that you would help him to decrease, Lord, so that you can increase him and speak to him. Not his word, but your words. Not his thoughts, but your thoughts. Not his heart, but your heart. I, I pray that our hearts and our minds are open, our spirits are open to receive the word today, to go out in the dark place Lord, and be light, shed your glory, take the gospel into this world, Lord, and give it to people unashamed, Lord, because we know that the gospel has power to save you. So we just pray that you put that gospel in our heart today, Lord, and just have us to go out and give it in this world, Lord, and I pray that you would move in this place like a Feel you here now, Lord. Just give us a deeper uh, a revelation of you today, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that we are here. We thank you that we are here and that we have hearts to, to grasp what you are giving us today. Lord. We give you glory, we give you honor, we love you, we thank you in Jesus' name.
don't have a Napoleon complex. I have to stand up here for recording purposes. So, to, or usually I'm down there, but I was advised to come up here so that way it's better visually uh, for the recording for those that are watching online. Uh, but listen, God is good. Amen. I can't, I can't say that enough. God is good. Um, all the time, absolutely. And um, I'm just grateful to, to look around. Another testimony is when I look around and see all of you beautiful people here, when this ministry started, it was my wife, myself, a Bible, and a cell phone on music door. That's, that's all we had. And we would sit outside at uh, downtown waterfront in Claremont, and we sat out there and said, Lord, we're just going to be faithful to what you called us to do. And we're not going to be worried about who shows up and who does what, just whatever the assignment is, whatever, popular or not, we're going to do it. And here we are two and a half years later, and to see all of you here, you know, faithfulness is what God is attracted to. And when he sees that you're faithful, he gives you increase. Anybody ever experienced increase in faithfulness? Amen. His grace is good for our, our unfaithfulness, but his increase comes with your faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Um, and so just, that's just another testimony that I want to share. And uh, I'm just grateful for that. And so uh, I want to kind of talk a little bit about a few different things. Um, first of all, last yesterday, I want to acknowledge my wife, First Lady Khalil, who went in. She's not used to be doing that. But yesterday, we had probably one of the best days of our life together. After being together since 2009, 10 years we've been together. And um, I think yesterday was probably one of the best days of our lives. Together, we were able, my sister Robin took our children, and we were able to go and hang out and, and just just be husband and wife. And not be mommy, daddy, not be pastor, first lady, but just be friend and family. And it's been so long since we had a day like that. It was just a blessing. And we stayed out beyond our curtain. <laughs> we were struggling, y'all. We were at the dinner table yesterday like this. And I know. I'm asking her if she's all right, but I'm ready to go sleep too. But it was fun. It was fun. So, that, so part of the, the, the drawbacks of that is when we saw the announcements. I put all the updated announcements in there, but this morning I was like, and I forgot to click save. So when I said it, it was still the old announcement from last week. But that's just a part of me not being somebody that's always used, you know, used to being up late. So, uh, but, but the word, God's going to give the word. Don't worry about me. God's going to give the word today, all right? So we're fine. But I just wanted to share that with you guys today because I really felt like uh, that was a blessing for me to be able to have that time with her. So um, I want to open up uh, in John chapter 5. I want to talk about some things with you guys. I hope it'll challenge you today um, to let go of some things. Uh, so let's go to John chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 8, and then we'll go into the Word. I'll have it up here as well, and um, if you don't have your phones, Bible, or anything like that, it'll be up there on the projector. So John chapter 5, start at verse 1, it says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda. And now, Bethesda is broken down into two different words. Bethesda, which means house of mercy, a place of flowing water. And it says, in which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And here, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Look at somebody ask him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? And then this man said, sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. And then this little extra tidbit here. We all like to see this at the end. At once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. And so what I want to talk to you about today is a simple question. Do you want to be healed? And some of you may be thinking, I'm in perfect health. There's nothing wrong with me. 
I'm fine. There's nothing that I need to do otherwise. But I'm not talking about just physically healed. I'm talking about emotionally healed. I'm talking about financially healed. I'm talking about spiritually healed. Do you want to be healed? Is there anything in your life that is holding you back from walking and moving in the freedom that God has for you? Fighting against the odds of life can be very discouraging. We look at this man who's been what they call invalid. He's been lame for 38 years. It's difficult, it's discouraging to be in a situation where you want something, but there's something holding you back that is outside of your control, if you will. And so this man for 38 years says that he wanted to be healed, but he placed his faith in a fool. I'll let that soak in for me. He placed his faith in the fool. And so for 38 years, thank you, brother, for 38 years, he sat this close to his breakthrough, but he didn't receive it because he sat and he allowed his breakthrough, he thought about it being in the fool. Are y'all with me this morning? So, all this time in his life, he wasted where he could have had a healing 38 years ago, but because he didn't realize the healing was not in the pool, it was in Jesus Christ, he remained lame most of his life. So there's a misconception about healing that I'm going to touch on really briefly. That Jesus personally handles all the healing and that we don't have to do anything but receive it. Can I, can I touch on that for a minute? I don't have to do anything but just say, yeah, 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 I, I receive it by faith. But faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. Now, why do I say that you got to do something? Because, see, when Jesus talked to the man and he said, do you even want to be healed? He first of all challenged him. Do you even want to be healed? Like, do you even realize what it takes to get the healing? And this man, the very first thing that came out of his mouth is what we will look at, you know, because we're, we're a tough society nowadays. So we can look at that as what he said as an excuse. Y'all may not want to see it that way. But what the first thing we have to do is we have to stop making excuses for our situation. And I'm going to say that because a lot of times we're in situations longer than we have to be because we allowed an excuse to comfort us. I'm going to challenge you today. <coughs> so this man has been sitting by the blessing, not realizing that the blessing is really not what he thought it was. It was a cry out to God. It was a matter of him having the faith to get up on his own and make something happen through faith. What do we do? in our life? What are some things that we battle with in our lives that has been with us for so long and we, and we just learn how to cope with it? We learn how to just utilize, well, that's just a part of life, or this is just a struggle that I have to deal with. Those things are crippling and disabling our ability to move forward in Christ, but the reality is when we say that, we're just laying, sitting by the pool. Some, some, some of y'all going to get it in the car. <laughs> We've been in this condition for what they say is 38 years, but in our life it may be longer, it may be shorter, when we have a plan to be set free, our own personal plan. We've been trying to be set free, or we've uh, allowed ourselves to believe that we're not supposed to be set free. We're supposed to just deal with certain issues of our lives. But the reality is that when we come to the recognition that our way does not work, but his way does, then a lot of us can be pulled out of situations a lot sooner than we've ever expected. Can amen. I get an amen? Amen. We're sitting this close to the house of mercy. We're sitting this close to the flowing water, but yet we cannot receive it because we put all of our faith in the thing instead of the creator of the thing. And so Jesus is challenging him. If you really want to be healed, then you won't spend so much time focusing on getting in the water. Because I am 
the living water. <clears throat> Do you even want to be healed? The fool appeared to be the answer, or else he would not have continued to show up. But he could not bring himself to the place of doing what he needed to do to receive what was right in front of him. Now, how often have we heard a word in church, or a song on the radio, or a message on TV, wherever the Lord positions us to hear this word for us? We recognize what we really need to do. We see the answer is laid out right in front of us, but what we are required to do receives us, uh, I'm sorry, to receive it, it goes against what we've conditioned ourselves to believe we're capable of doing. This man didn't believe that he could get into the, into the pool because he had been laying there, laying for so many years. And sometimes our condition, the things that we allow to be around us for so long, it disables us mentally to believe that we can't do things that we should be able to do. But the Word of God says that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So we have to be careful with what we allow ourselves to believe because those things can cripple us down the road. And so sometimes we settle for the idea of being free instead of actually being free in itself. And what I've noticed sometimes is that when we, you know, you, you ever met anybody that's, that's, that's stuck in their ways? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You ever met somebody that no matter what right is, no matter what wrong is, no matter what is, is, is biblically sound or whatever, if I've been doing this for 30, 40 years, then look, this is the way it's going to be. This becomes my truth. Amen? And so that really what's that is not so much a person is just stuck in their ways. It's more so along the lines of this person is just flat out stuck. How can you be a child of God? Now, now, just hear me out. How can you be a child of God? See, a child of God is a student. A child of God is teachable. A child of God is moldable. How can we be a child of God yet be stubborn and stuck in our ways? Oh, man. And so what I have seen in my life, I have seen where stubbornness has crippled people worse than a car accident. I've seen it. Because mentally they're in such a bondage that no matter, Jesus can stand right before them and say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He can slap them, they can fly across the room. But because they're stuck in their ways, they will not change. They'll just see it as a powerful right hook. <laughs> but I've seen where stubborn spirits can do more damage to people, to people than any physical impairment could ever do. This man represents a lot of us today. It's too difficult for me to get from here to here because I've conditioned myself to believe that I cannot move. I've conditioned myself to believe that I need other people around me to do it for me. See, the first thing that came out of his mouth was he's blaming other people. See, I tried, but they. But if I realize that I can do all things through Christ, who strengthens me, then it's no longer about them. And so what, what Jesus had to tell this man is, you don't need the pool. You just need me. Take up your mat and walk. For 38 years, you sat this close to what you thought was a blessing. But the reality is the blessing was standing right here all this time. So let them jump in the pool. You just get your mat up and go home. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So this man was healed. And this is what somebody about this, because he was healed on what they call the Sabbath. He was healed on the Sabbath day. And so obviously you're always going to have these haters. These people are coming. You're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to pick up your mat and carry nothing around. You're supposed to just relax and chill on the Sabbath, right? But how many of y'all know that God does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants? Right. It's up to you to ask for him to do it and to be available to receive it. And so, we're trying to break some walls down here. The healing is yours. And I'm not just talking about the physical healing. I'm talking about the spiritual healing, the emotional healing, all of the things that we need in order to be able to walk in the fullness and the freedom that God has called us to do. The healing is ours. But the healing can be very uncomfortable. Healing can be very painful. A 
I'll tell you a story about how painful healing can be. You guys can probably see my finger. This finger right here is bent. This finger is straight. I was playing basketball back at FSU about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, probably about 12 years ago. And I dislocated my finger. And this part of my finger was literally sitting up here. And it hurt. <laughs> There's no lies here today. It hurt. Okay? And so I had the trainer, they had to pull my finger, snap it back in place. And they told me, they said, listen, this is going to hurt when I snap it back in place, but it's not going to hurt for too long. So I'm like, whatever, just do what you got to do, because my finger's not supposed to be sitting up here. All right? So I need to go ahead and fix the finger. So they snapped it back in place, and that little bit did hurt for a while. And then they came with this splint. It's basically it's like, the, like a popsicle stick or something like that. And they put one on top, they put one on the bottom, they taped it up really tight. And they said, this is probably going to hurt the most because in order for you to heal, we need this to be straight. So you have to leave this splint on for a certain amount of time because if you take it off, then you're going to heal incorrectly, which means that you're not really healed at all. So I had to leave this split on, and, and I'm talking about healing right now. So I'm trying to go through the healing process, but this split is uncomfortable. No matter what I do, no matter what I, I try to pick up stuff, and I've got a, this split on my finger, and just the pain alone of the finger being straight, forced straight, let me say it that way, forced to be straight, the pain was unbearable. And so what I ended up doing was I aborted the process early because it hurt too much. How many of us have aborted the process of healing too soon because it hurts too much? And he told me, if you abort the process too soon, your finger will not completely heal. <laughs> There's proof in the pudding. So I aborted the process too soon because it was too painful for me to continue. So I never completely healed from that injury. What are some things in our lives that we have had to deal with and go through? And God has said, I need you to be healed from this situation, so let's go through the process. But when we deal with the process, it hurts so bad as well. I don't want to deal with the pain. Amen. I don't want nothing to do with it. I'd rather just get it over. Let's just get past the pain part and let me move on with my life. Never dealing with the wound, but tending to the pain. How I many of know if you don't deal with the wound, the pain is going to come back? The pain is going to come back. And so sometimes we rely on the Tylenols of life okay, instead of the splint. See, we need the splint more than the Tylenol. See, because pain will go away at some point in time if you deal with the wound. I wanted to surpass, I wanted to go beyond the, 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 the healing part of it, and I just wanted to go on with my life. So I aborted the process too soon because it was too painful to go through the process. What are we dealing with in our lives? That's just too painful. So I'd rather sweep it under the rug and act like it's all good, and as long as you don't see it, then maybe I am here. We, we, we want to believe that as long as y'all don't know my mess, then maybe I am here. But I want to challenge you today to lift the rug up and let's deal with those issues today. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to, I'm going to read another text to you. I don't know if you guys can see it, but I'm going to read it and, and just follow with me. In James 5, verses 13 through 16, it says, Is any among you afflicted? Let them pray. Is any married? Let them sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. They shall be forgiven. And then verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. There's a difference between forgiveness and healing. And I want to share this with you guys. I shared this last weekend at the men's conference. I want to share it with you all as well because I don't believe it's just a man word. I believe it's a God's children word. There's a difference between forgiveness 
and heal it. Verse 15 says that if you confess your sins, God will forgive you. And verse 16 says you confess your faults one to another, you'll be healed. I hope y'all get this thing. You mean to tell me that I pray to God for forgiveness, he'll do that, but then he's going to send me to my fellow brother and sister for healing? Yes. Why? Because we believe him to use people to bless us, but we don't believe him to use people to heal us either? He will use people to heal you. So he says, confess your faults one to another, and you'll be healed. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about spiritual healing. We need spiritual healing in order to be effective to do God's work. Why do I say that? I'm going to show you a quick story. I had to get clearance from my wife this morning before I shared it to you. I mean, it was not good to share pillow talk with the church. And that's why I said it's okay. <laughs> so I had to get her permission today. So I'm going to share this with you. This morning, after having a, a great time together yesterday, you know, and no marriage is perfect. Any perfect marriages in here? No? Okay. All right. So we, we all family. We good. Okay. So, so we, we have our issues. We have our ups and downs. And, and this morning, after having an excellent night, we were able to have a great conversation about some things that bother us about one another. Transparency. On somebody. Vulnerability. We were talking about, you know, because we went to like a little, uh, one of my fellow pastors, he had something at his church, and it was like a little Valentine's get together for husbands and wives, and it was really cool. So they had these questions you got to ask. And as you ask the question, you know, typically the spouses look at you like, oh, for real? You know, it's one of those moments, right? And so they asked some tough questions for us because these were areas that we kind of battled with. And so that, this morning when we got up, we, we had a conversation, and I said to her, I was like, you know, so what is it about me that sends you to this place? And so here we are, we're having this moment, moment because the, <coughs> my pet peeve, if, I, if you will, with my wife, is when we're having discussions, sometimes you get a little loud. Sometimes you turn the volume up. You turn the volume up, i say it that way. And, 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 that, and that bothers me, right? And I never could understand or formulate and express how or why it bothered me. For, we've been together 10 years. Never could express why it bothered me, but I know that it did. And so when, it, when I get bothered, I turn around and verbally attack. So there's this battle that's been going on in us. I'm going to get loud with you. Okay, well, I'm going to verbally attack. And so we have this World War III in the house going on, and it's been going on for an amount of years. And we always were looking at it like, well, if you change, come on, somebody, y'all, am I the only person that was Well, if you just stop doing that, then I'll stop doing this. But then what happens is one person will say, okay, well, let me change. I'll work on it. I'll stop doing this. But the other person still doesn't change. So we both are dealing with issues that what we both need to be healed from. And for so many years, we would just look at each other like, I'm telling you, if you I promise you. I'll be the best husband you've ever seen in your life if you just stop doing that. I'll be the best wife you've ever seen if you just stop doing that. Still putting it off on the other person. But this morning, we had an opportunity to be vulnerable. For the first time in 10 years, I opened up to her, and God revealed to me, why is it that the yelling part takes me to that place? And it wasn't until this morning I realized it's because when I was little, I grew up in a household where I got yelled at for everything. My mother yelled at me for everything, no matter if I tried to do something and did it wrong, or if I didn't do something, no matter what it was, I was always being yelled at. My dad, who was an alcoholic at the time, he would yell at me. And so I'm, all, I'm getting yelled at from everybody, and so could you imagine as a child, and both of your parents that you love, that's all they do is yell at you. It does damage long term. So here I am as a grown man, still acting like a little boy emotionally. When my wife raises her voice, it's not so much because she's trying to belittle me, but that's how I received it because I never healed from what happened to me when I was a young man. And so now this morning I was able to tell her that for the very first time since we've been together, she never knew that. And so I was able to be vulnerable to her and open up to her and tell her, this is what it is that really gets me. This is why it bothers me when you do that. And guess what happened? Because I was able to be vulnerable with her, she was able to turn around and be vulnerable with me. And she shared some things with me. Well, this is why I do it. Because when I was young, I grew up in a house where that's all we did. 
We did the same thing. So in my household, they yelled, they attacked. In her household, they yelled, they attacked. So we basically are byproducts of what we grew up in because we never healed from it. And so could you imagine trying to minister supernatural anointing of God to other people while you're still battling and being bound by these issues of your past? How effective is it? How effective should it be? So we had a moment where we were like, I'm not crying, you're crying. I'm not crying, you're crying. You're wiping your eyes, there's onions in the room. Because we had a moment that we had never shared before. And, and even though we love each other to the ends of this world, we never was able to be vulnerable with each other to say, this is why I feel this way. And, this is, and now we've gotten to a place from that moment until now, there has been so much healing from that moment to now. Like, I, I, don't, I feel so different today than I felt yesterday. And now I feel more free today than I felt yesterday. She feels more free today than she felt yesterday because her husband finally opened up and said what has been bothering him all his life. And my wife finally opened up to me and said what's been bothering her all of her life. And so we were able to get over this stumbling block that has kept us. The enemy wants you to believe it's just your husband or your wife's fault. Or it's the other person. I'll say it that way. It's the other person. It's not you. It had nothing to do with you because if they, if they didn't do that, you wouldn't respond this way. And so what I want to share with you today that it says, confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. We got some serious healing this morning. That's right. And now I want to challenge you and release this into you to be healed today. So my question to you today is, what is it that's keeping you from experiencing the fullness of God? It may be something that you've been battling for 20, 30 years. It may be something you've been battling for 5, 10 years. Whatever it is, what is it that you need a healing from that you're keeping to yourself because you don't feel like you can share it with anyone else? What is stopping you from releasing it? Because the Bible says if you want to be healed, find a covenant brother. Find a covenant sister and share. Confess one to another. And I'm going to tell you what we learned last weekend, and it all started from last Sunday, last Saturday at the men's conference. Because when we all, we have four different speakers, we all preach similar things about the same thing, about just being transparent with one another. I think men, we've lost that. Men have lost transparency with one another. We just, we're too macho. We don't want to share so much. We just, this is me. Leave me alone now. I'm not letting you in my box. But, but God is calling us to be vulnerable one to another so that we can be effective. The Bible says the effective prayer of the righteous of Elder much. So we have to become effective. And last weekend, when we all preached about being transparent and let healing take place from that, all the way up until even Friday, I was getting phone calls from people that was at that conference and I released something to a friend of mine. I released something to my wife that I have not shared with anybody ever in my life. And I'm a totally different man because of it. This is the ripple effect of doing what God has called us to do. Just, just put the macho stuff down for a minute and just, I need to get healed. This is like Jesus asked the man to fool. He's asking us, do you even want to be healed? What are you, what are you holding in? What is it something that, that you're battling with? Some people are battling addiction. Some people are battling alcoholism. Some people are battling lust of different types. People are battling different things. Some people are battling with anger. Why? Because maybe you grew up in a household where anger wasn't, that wasn't your thing, and now you're, it's in you. You don't know why you're so mad at somebody all the time. And you can't explain these feelings. You're battling with something that God wants to heal you from, and he's asking you today, do you even want to be healed? Because with healing comes a release. With healing comes a release of an anointing. To God, when, he, when he's ready to use you, he wants you to be free. But see, sometimes we try to operate and function with wounds instead of fully healed. And so we don't ever get to do, the, we don't get to see the, the, the manifestation the way we thought we would because there's still some things within us that we need to release and re let go of so that way we can be fully used by him. Y'all with me this morning? The reality is, is that wounded people will only wound people. Hurt people will hurt people. So I'm going to say it this way. Wounded people cannot help people. Wounded people cannot be disciples. Can I, can I be transparent with you? Because what are you ministering? 
Physically, I'm with you, but I can only minister to you according to my spiritual state. So if my spiritual state is wounded, then what am I ministering to you? I'm ministering more wounds to you. Because I want to interpret God's word according to my hurts. I'm going to interpret God's word according to my pain, and I'm going to inflict that on you, and now that's what you're going to believe. So there has to be healing that takes place, and that way we can rightly divide the word of God and be able to minister it accordingly. So don't settle for being physically present, because you can't, you can only minister according to your spiritual state. Amen? Amen? Amen. I want to read another scripture to you. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. I'm going to try to further confirm this because I know sometimes we have issues with sharing our issues with one another. We have, you know, the, I can't tell them that. The enemy is telling us, no, keep that to yourself. But there is a confidant. There's one person that I don't believe that God will send you to a church or, or have you surrounded by people that not one person there you can be real with. I just don't believe that he will do that. And so, here it is in Nehemiah. It says, on the 24th day of the night of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. And they stood in their places. They confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. So they stood in their places. They are collectively together. They confessed their sins one to another and the sins of their ancestors, those that were before them. And they stood where they were and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. That's a long time. It's about eight hours, what, what, about six, eight hours, something like that. And spent another quarter in confession in worshiping the Lord their God. So this is what they did. They spent a half a day between confessing sins and worshiping the Lord their, the Lord their God. That lets you know how serious and powerful confession is, one to another. They're collectively together, confessing sins. They're not secretly trying to, you know, well, no, I ain't gonna talk about that one. I'm gonna hopefully, you know, they don't know about this one. They're literally, they're out there, every sin that there is, that that's coming to them for themselves or what they know about their ancestors, they're putting all of it on the table because they want to be healed. I'm gonna confess everything outwardly in the open. I'm not giving the devil any room in my life. If you tell on him, he can't do anything, right? If you if you just tell on him, he, he has nothing to use. Like, oh, there's a movie, Eight Mile, where, where the guy was rapping against another rapper. He knew the guy was going to try to call out all his little secrets, so he went on ahead and said it first. And the other dude was speechless. He had nothing to say. So if we use the enemy, we do that the same way with the enemy. We confess our sins one to another, then there's no secrets that we have to worry about somebody finding out. So public confession does not necessarily mean I'm going to put it on the news. <laughs> or I'm going you know, to blast it on the radio. It's when you're amongst the believers and you know that you need to be healed from something because see, the devil will cripple you. The longer you keep something in, it becomes a stumbling block to your freedom. And so being able to find that person, even if it's just one, to be able to say, this is what I'm battling with. Now listen, I don't need you to try to fix me. I just need you to pray with me. Come on, somebody. And that's what the Bible says, because when you confess one to another, the next thing it says do is pray. So when I confess to you what I'm battling with, the next thing I need you to do is take me by the hand and pray with me. That's all I need you to do. And not, not, and not try to hold it over my head and, or not try to correct my issues and tell me, well, you ain't supposed to be doing that. I know that. That's why I came to you and confessed and said I need prayer. So when we mature to that place where I don't care what you've done, if you need me to pray with you over it, let's do that, and then we're going to move on and just believe God to, to heal you from that. And that's where we got to go. We got to get to that place. Because as long as I stay isolated and not want to share what my struggles are, guess who suffers? First me, but then my family. Why? Because I put this wall up. Y'all know what that wall looks like. You put that wall up. And, and no matter how hard you try, they can't get in because you won't really let them in emotionally. You, can't, you don't even know this part about me. So you're putting a wall up. So we have to be healed from that so that we can actually be fully equipped to do what God has called us to do. And that's why they, they, they confess publicly because they want to get it out there. Now Ephesians 4, 21 to 25, it says, when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth, that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life. Keep secrets. Don't tell anybody. It's between me and him, right? He forgave me, but now he wants you to get healed. 
But put off your old self, which is being corrupted by his deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then verse 25 says, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood, and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Put off all falsehood. It's like my brother told me last, said last week. Stop being fake. Come on, somebody. Stop being fake. Stop acting like you got it all together, because the reality is, is we truly do not have it all together, church. And, and once we can come to a place where we just become real about it, I got struggles. I got issues. I, I, I'm not, I don't have it all together. And that's why I need my fellow brother, because if I had it all together, I wouldn't need the body. But I don't have it together, and that's why I need help. I need a prayer partner. I need somebody that I can confide in and be able to share these things and be real with. And so this is what he's saying. Put off all falsehood. Because we're trying to get healed here. We're trying to be a healed body so we can minister God's gospel. But we can't be healed if you're not going to be real with it. And if I'm not going to be real with you, then what are we doing here? So can we, can we stop being fake, ladies and gentlemen? Yes. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, being transparent and being real is what moves us to the next level. I think about a show. My wife watches this, this show. Uh, Ramsey, Dave Ramsey. Uh, is it Ramsey? Not Ramsey. Uh, what's the chef that cooks stuff and he got a team? It is Ramsey. I'm thinking about my national So Ramsey is the best one now. Okay. All right. So, so he has this show. And what they do, they compete against each other in the kitchen. So they're cooking. And you got this team over here communicating. You got this other team over here communicating. They're trying to make food. They're trying to make it clean. People are waiting. But sometimes people fall behind. And so they're asking you, I need a time check. I need a time check. How much time you got? And so they got to tell them, all right, two minutes or 30 seconds or whatever it is. If that person is not real, it messes up the whole meal. Because this person is expecting you to be honest and straightforward so that way they can put the meal together at the right time and deliver a great meal and deliver it the right way. But if I'm not being real with you about how much longer I need to cook the steak, then I'm going to end up delivering an undercooked steak, right? And then you as the team leader are going to look bad. And so we have to be real with you. And so I want to use that as an example because what we have to understand is the exact same thing in the kingdom. If I'm not being real with you and I'm saying let's go out and minister some folks, but yet I'm hurting, we're going to go out there and we're going to be ineffective. I might mess around and get my butt kicked spiritually. That's the reality. Jesus I know about. Paul I know about. But you, I don't know. So we got to be healed. We got to be in a place where we recognize that I got to be right. And I got to be real with you that I'm not right so we can get together and pray so that I can be right so that when we go out into the communities and do things that we are right. I think we underestimate the superpower, the super anointing power of God from transparency. I think we underestimate what it really can do and what the anointing that can truly flow when we are utilizing what his word says. When we just truly just stick to what God's word says about being real with each other, I think we undermine what type of anointing can flow from that and what type of healing that can be contagious from that. Because I think that if we did it, he will honor that. And I think through him honoring that, we'll see a lot more things manifest. And so I'm going to say this, and then we'll get ready to close here. What if the hidden things that you know to be affecting your walk with the Lord are only still with you because you refuse to be transparent about your need to get rid of them? What if God is just waiting for you to just release it? Just release it. Be real about it being an issue. Because some people say they have these things, but I can control that. It's you that triggers it, but I can control it. What if God is saying that, oh, I want to do so much through you. I want to do so much through you, but I cannot because you won't let it go. Because you won't just simply release it. You won't just confess that it's something you need to be healed from. And just in that confession alone, I can just pour out a blessing over you, and then you can do everything that I called you to do. And again, I'm not telling you to tell everybody. But you should tell somebody. Amen? Amen. Amen. So the last point I want to share with you guys is until we decide that we want to be healed, the external features of our home will look beautiful, but the inside will be a mess. 
You ever been to somebody's house on the outside, like, oh, we got a nice house. And they let you in, and the house is just a wreck. Just all kinds of mess, just, just chaos all in the house. And that's spiritually. That's what a lot of us look like. And I'll say, I'll just say me as well. Man, you, you're blessed, man. I can see the smile on your face. You're blessed. You look good, and you and your, your family look this, that, and the other. But yet on the inside, you're wounded. And I think once we get to a place where we're tired of people recognizing the outside, knowing that we're dying on the inside, and I think that's when we'll start to release things so that we can truly be clean on the inside out. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what I want to do now, I want to, in closing, I want to ask if anything that was said today pierced your heart. I'm battling with this, this issue. Whatever that issue is, I don't have to be specific in order for you to know that it's something that you need to release from your life so that you can move forward. I realized this morning it was a matter of me being healed from things that happened when I was a young child. That I'm a different person than I was yesterday. Just, just I'm 40, I'll be 42 in a couple months. And it took me that long to figure it out. So if it took me that long to figure out, is there anything else that you may have? Maybe that light came on me, you know, I need to be here for that. I need to be here for that. If that's you today, just pray for him. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. What I want to do is I want to pray for you, those of you that raised your hand today. Because I believe that God has called you. He asked you if you wanted to be healed today, and you said yes. Amen?